right now, I want you to follow along with me in these notes. Acts 3, 1 through 6. This is what the Word of God says. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. At 3 in the afternoon, now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg for those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, Nazareth, get up and walk. What an epic miracle. Everywhere Jesus walked, he was doing miracles. But I want to bring your attention to the part where it says he was at the gate called beautiful. The gate was beautiful. And that's exactly how God views gates. He thinks gates are are amazing and they're beautiful throughout the bible you can see the significance of these gates so today i want to show you what part gates play in your life and my sermon title is actually a question and this is it which gate will you choose which gate will you choose let's bow our heads and let's pray god thank you for your grace god thank you for your love thank you for sc church thank you for the kids worshiping in the auditorium behind us. God, I pray you fill this place with your presence. Thank you for every man, woman, and child. Bless them. Give them favor abundantly. God, we love you. Help your word to ring true. And everybody said, amen. Hey, give someone a high five and you can be seated. We're talking about gates today. Psalm 87, 2 says, the Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. He said in the Old Testament, one of the promises to Abraham's seed is that you will possess the gates of your enemy. Over and over again, you see gates. He said in another place, turn the battle to the gates. God is always thinking about gates. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than any other place In the temple, he loves the gates more than the Holy of Holies. He loves the gates more than the foundations of Zion. There's a difference between a wall and a gate. A wall keeps people out, and a gate lets people in. A gate swings open and shut in both directions. And the hinge on the gate is an illustration of divine choice. God has a fondness that someone can choose to stay, or they can choose to go. A gate doesn't just mean you have access to enter into the gate and you're there. A gate means you have the option and choice to exit out of that gate and leave. And let me tell you, friends, God loves that. I love the, fa- the fact that you choose to choose me is what God says. They don't have to, but they choose me. They don't have to praise me. They don't have to go to church. They don't have to join community groups, be in a serve team, be with the worship team. But they've chosen to, and it delights Almighty God. Joshua 24, 15 says, choose this day who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. How many of you have made that choice for you, for your house, for your children, for your family? Come on, give God some praise if you made that choice. We're going to serve the Lord. And God loves gates. He loves choice. God created man out of dirt in his own image, breathed breath into Adam, created Eve, made the tree of knowledge good and evil, and put it in the garden with them. But God didn't put an electrical fence around it and say, if you get close to it, you're going to get zapped. No, God left it in the open and said, I want you to choose me. I want you to choose The right thing, because listen, when we choose Almighty God, when we choose the right thing, it delights his heart and it thrills him more than anything. God loves choice. And he loves the fact that we've gathered here today at SC Church out of our own 
free will. We're in here worshiping his name, lifting up the name of Jesus, not because we are command. No, we do it out of our own free will. We're not obligated to praise like angels. We're not like robots programmed to worship, but we worship out of choice. Let me tell you, when we choose to worship God when we're going through trials, when we choose to worship God when we're going through tribulations and tough times, but we've already made the decision, God says there's a blessing in choosing to serve me even through the tough times, even through the hard times. You know, there's an amazing story in Numbers 35 about gates. The Bible says that God spoke to Moses and said, I want you to build six cities, and they're going to be called the cities of refuge. And these cities will be geographically placed throughout Israel so that someone can run to these cities of refuge and have protection if they have killed someone on accident. Okay, if they're swinging an axe and the axe head flies off and just smokes somebody and kills them, well, that was an accident. The thing about back in the, the Old Testament is the law was an eye for an eye. What this means is if someone kills someone in your family, the law said that you had the right to go to that person and blood for blood, you could kill them. And the person that takes vengeance, that takes justice for them in each family is called the blood avenger. Okay, the blood avenger, if someone killed someone in their family, the blood avenger could go get them and just kill them. Kill them. That's, that's what the process said. That's what the society said of that day, unless it was on accident and they ran. The blood avenger is on their tail. They're running and they cross the gates of the city of refuge. The blood avenger could come up to the gate, could come up to the walls, but they couldn't touch them because they had the protection of the city of refuge, a place of safety, a place of comfort, a place of protection. The children were safe there. The Bible says that he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High God shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, he is my strength. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in times of trouble. If you believe that, put your hands together. God's so good. That's who our God is, under the shadow of the Almighty. And here we are in guilt. Here we are in judgment. The law says we deserve to die. We deserve judgment. But if we run to the city of refuge, the city of refuge, his name is Jesus Christ. You can choose him. You can choose life. You can choose grace. And you choose forgiveness in a new life. If you run to him, he will never cast you out. Do you understand that? If you run to him, you're safe no matter what society says, no matter what religion says, no matter what people around you say. If you run to Jesus, you're in the city of refuge, and he will protect you. God is saying, come into life. Come into the place of prayer. Come into the place of his righteousness. Enter his love by choice. You're in a refuge. You have security. But I'm saying today that it's an amazing thing that we can get into the gate, but there's one disadvantage. There's a gate at the front. And the same gate that you enter, you can exit if you choose. If you went outside the gate, then you are no longer protected and no longer safe. And there's a real warning to us today, and it's a very good thing. Once you enter into Christ, listen to me. Be careful you don't slip back into the old life that God got you out of. You're safe as long as you're in Christ and you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be a, have a perfect record. You have to run back to Christ. You mess up, you get up, and you go back to Jesus. Be careful not to let sin become a part of your life because the blood avenger is waiting outside the gate. He's waiting to get you. Second Samuel 3, there is a story in the Old Testament about a man named Abner. And Abner was King David's son, one of, one of King David's sons. And Abner killed a man out of self-defense. And the man's blood avenger, the guy that he killed, was Joab. You've heard Joab. Joab is a bad dude. Okay, He's a mighty warrior. And he's coming to get his vengeance. 
his justice for what Abner did. And he's hot on his tail, and he's about to catch Abner, but Abner crosses into Hebron. Hebron is a city of refuge. He is protected. He's safe. And he's over there, and Joab comes up to the gate and begins to speak quietly, softly to Abner, trying to coax him, trying to trick him outside the gates, outside the protection. And listen to me, Abner should have never said, I'm going out there. He should have said, no, bro, you kidding me? You can come in here and talk to me. I'm not going out there. You come on up in here, I'm not stepping out of protection. Here's what I think. We need to get to a place where we, where we give some positive peer pressure, okay? I think serving God's cool, and if you don't, you don't have it going on. Okay, I think we should put some peer pressure saying, I think we should, we should get great families that raise a great household, that honor their wives, that raise incredibly godly children. That's what I'm doing. You come up in here, I'm not going out there to where there's no protection. But Abner, he was a fool. He listened to what Joab had to say. Joab spoke to him quietly, coaxing him seductively, saying, it's all right. Everything's going to be fine. Abner agreed to step outside the gates of that protection of Hebron. And Joab reached around and stabbed Abner and killed him right there. Why? Because he stepped outside. David, his father, cried and said, Abner died a fool's death. Why? Because he didn't have to die. He could have stayed under the protection of the city of refuge. You know, back in 2015... There was a story that was in the news, you might remember, about Cecil the lion in uh, Zimbabwe. And Cecil the lion was in this national park that was a protected no-hunting zone. You could not hunt in this refuge in Zimbabwe, Cecil the lion. And all the locals loved this lion, and, you know, tourists would come. And they loved because you could literally get 10 meters away from this lion and take pictures. I don't know why anyone in their right mind would ever want to do that. But apparently there's people that do that in this world. And so Cecil, the lion, is in this protected area. And there's a big game hunter that came to Zimbabwe. He paid $50,000 to kill a lion. Well, he hired this big group. And they took an, an elephant carcass and drugged this dead elephant carcass through the protected area, out into the unprotected lands. Well, Cecil the lion caught that scent, and he followed it out to the unprotected lands. And this, this hunter shot him with his bow and killed Cecil the lion. But the interesting part of the story is that Cecil had a brother, and they named all these lions. They loved these lions. His name was Jericho. And Jericho began on a daily basis going out to the unprotected land and back to the refuge, to the unprotected land back and forth. And they concluded this. They said, he's going out and he's searching for his brother. He's trying to find his brother. Listen to me very carefully. When you step out of the shelter of the Almighty, you're not just affecting yourself, but you're drawing a brother. You're drawing a sister. You're drawing a spouse, a child. No one dies under themselves. And no one lives unto them. You go together. You know, years ago, I say years ago, back when I was in high school, like that was so long ago. <laughs> years and years ago, there was a guy that um, came to Eagle Creek. And he just got his life radically transformed. God just got a hold of him. And God changed his life so much that literally you could see him glowing when he walked in the room. He just was so much fun to be around. He was an athlete. I was in high school, and he, he began coaching me on the baseball team, and everyone loved this guy. Jesus just transformed his life and turned him around. Well, he ended up moving back home, and when he moved back home, his older brother came into his room one night, said, hey, bro, we're celebrating me tonight. It's time to celebrate. I don't do that anymore. Yes, you do for one night. Come on, let's. I don't do it. Come on, one night. It'll be okay. So they go out, and one night, the combination of alcohol and drugs. And the next morning, his brother 
went into his room to wake him up, and he had died in his sleep. His brother was so distraught that he ended up taking his own life that very next day. Let me tell you, and listen to me very closely, you have no idea how devastating one moment outside the city of refuge can be. That young man decided to walk out for one night outside the city of refuge. Let me tell you, stay in Christ. No one goes alone. No man lives unto himself, and no man dies unto himself. But this, this, is, this is a very positive message because let's, let's flip it around. Let's flip the whole thing. If you go into Christ, you're not going alone. Okay, if you serve Jesus and you take yourself in there, you have the promise that your spouse will follow, your brother, your sister, your kids, you'll be saved and your entire household will be saved if you go into Christ. Come on, put your hands together right now if you know that's true. I speak that prophetically. You and your entire household, even if it is not right now, you will be saved. I know somebody needs to claim that this morning. Somebody needs to claim that. Come on, give God some praise right now. You'll be saved. I used to think that the older that I got, you know, now that I'm an old man, you know, I'm old and seasoned. I, I used to think I'd get old and just kind of say, okay, no more temptation. This thing's done. I'm past that. I'm all, let me tell you, I found out the older that I get, the tougher it gets. The older that I get, the more grace that it takes. And I fall down, and I get right back up, and I run to Almighty God because I know God is the only person that has fulfillment, joy, love, breakthrough. Being in Jesus is the only way to live your life. Let me tell you, fulfillment evermore is in the arms of Almighty God. And that's what I've come to find out. God so loved gates that he put gates on hell. Hell has gates. The Bible speaks of hell as a real place. Matthew 16 and 18 says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Which means if people go to hell, it will not be because a loving God sent them there. They chose to go. They chose to trample the blood of the cross under their feet. They chose to resist the Holy Spirit. They chose to say no after the voice came and invited them. Understand, God sends no man to hell. God didn't even make hell for human beings. God made hell for Satan and the fallen angels. That's how wonderful our God is. And I think it's a sad, sad thing. Do you know how hard it is for someone like you to go to hell? Do you know how many roadblocks you literally have to step over to go to hell? You have to step over every testimony of every Christian. You have to step over the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, all the miracles you see around you. If you go to hell, it will be because you've earned it and you've chosen, you've stepped over so much truth. Hell has gates. But I'm here to proclaim today that heaven has gates. God put 12 gates of pearl, according to Revelation 21, because no one makes it to heaven by accident. Let me tell you, it's by appointment. You choose Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you and proclaim today, I'm not afraid of death. I'm not afraid to die. I'm not afraid of where this life brings me because I've chosen, I've decided I'm with Jesus. And I understand when this life's over, I'm going to step through the gates, those pearly gates of heaven. How many of you are happy that God defeated death, hell, and the grave and made a place for us in eternity? Come on, give God some praise. That's what it's all about. Friday, as I said, at 1.30, uh, my grandmother, my nana, she went to be with Jesus. And Mary Elizabeth Brock, she was just a, a beautiful, really impressive, funny, funny lady. I mean, she was incredible in every way, shape, and form. Um, at a very young age, she decided, and she chose, she said, I'm, I'm serving God no matter what. She married a preacher, and she was the 
organist and led the music in, in her church, and she was just beautiful everywhere she went. When my mom was two years old, um, her dad, Nana's husband, was preaching at the pulpit, had a heart attack, and died. And my Nana said, you know what? She didn't say, I'm finished with this God thing. I don't know. She had already made a decision. No matter what, she served Almighty God. She had an impressive life. You know how you have images of people. The image I have of my Nana is going to her house, and she was just excellent in everything that she did. She actually made beauty products and made her own beauty creams. A lot of you guys used to go to her parties, and she had her own beauty studio with, you know, mirrors all in it. And I can see her with dozens of ladies over at her house, all of them in that beauty studio, and her looking so beautiful, going from person to person, fixing them up, telling them jokes. She was the life of the party. You know, one of her um, neighbors gave the account that they remember looking out one day, and they saw my nana washing her car in her front, in her front driveway. And she had the water hose out, and they said it was the craziest thing because she actually was in a dress, fully, full makeup, hair curled, in high heels, washing that car. Let me tell you, that's my nana right there. <laughs> Always looking good. You know, these last months, it was, it was very apparent that these were nana's last days. And she went in and out of, of really being there. And my dad told this story last week that last Sunday, she came to and she was there and she looked at my mom and she said, Deonza, am I, am I dying? I am dying, aren't I? And my mom said, Mom, are you, are, you scared? are you scared to die? And she just laughed. She said, oh, oh, I'm not afraid. I am not afraid because she had made her choice. Death couldn't even threaten her. She understood where she stood with Almighty God. You know, I remember being at her house as a, as a little kid. And uh, whenever we would leave, she would stand at the front door and she would just wave to us. And I'd get in the car and I'd look back. She'd still be there waving. And then we'd drive down. She'd still be there waving on down until we disappeared off in the distance. She would stay there. I remember that so vividly. And I know that when we leave to go be in heaven and join her. We're going to be able to look off into the distance. We're going to see Mary Elizabeth Brock standing at the gates of heaven, waiting to join us and welcome us into heaven. Today, I want to do something special. I want to pay my Nana some honor. Can we get on our feet and give my Nana a standing ovation? She's walking on streets of gold. She's in heaven. She walked through the pearly gates, and she finished well. We love you. Special, special lady. You can be seated. I close with this. Hell has gates. Heaven has gates. And last of all, His presence has gates. Psalm 100 verse 4 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. What is that? Enter his gate. Choose praise. Choose thanksgiving. This thing is a choice what you get out of it. You're sitting on a row right now. Some people are going to be blessed on the same row and some people will leave with nothing. Why? Because it's a choice to praise and give him thanksgiving in this place and his presence will always be here. I don't know about you, but I want to praise Almighty God. I want to praise him every day of my life. I want to give him my best. I want to make the decision. I'm with you and I'm never, ever turning back. You know, in uh, Second Samuel in, actually, uh, it's in Judges. Judges 16, verse 3. Samson goes to the city of Gaza. 
And Gaza was an idolatrous city. Gaza was a place of evil. Gaza equaled the evil place. Samson goes to the gates of Gaza, the gates of the evil place, and rips the gates up. He removes the gates, the posts, the hinges, and all, and takes them up onto the hill. In other words, to say, you know what? I'm removing the choice to the evil place. I'm removing the gates that lead to my demise. And it's so interesting because in that moment he was proclaiming, I choose Jesus above all else. I've made my decision, I'm not going back. But it's sad that he removed the gates to the evil place, but yet left the gates in his own personal life of his own sinful desires, which was ultimately his ultimate demise. Matthew 5, 29 and 30 says this. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. These are Jesus' words. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. One old preacher said, well, if that's the case, I'll have no parts left of my whole body. That might be how you feel. Jesus was using this symbolically for us to understand there are some gates that we need to remove. Let me tell you, it'd be like, literally think about it, it'd be like gouging out an eye or removing a hand if you removed the technology in your life. Get rid of my phone, get rid of my computer, Netflix. Are you kidding me? Some of us need to remove the gates in our life. Some of, some of you, it's a cell phone number. Some of you, it's a secret email conversation. Some of you need to remove friends, remove the opportunity. That thing that has access to your eye gate, remove it, get rid of it. You know, when I lived in Malibu, California, going to Pepperdine, I've seen some fires, folks. I mean, you've seen it on the news. I've seen it in person. These fires in California would burn for weeks and months. It's the most devastating, the saddest thing. I'd be driving down the highway and for miles and miles, burn. I mean, it was crazy, so sad. But I would see these firefighters and they would be miles, of, the fire would be out there and the firefighters would be miles away chopping wood having bulldozers, making a line. What was it? It was a fire line, a burn line. They were saying, you know what? I'm cutting off the access. I'm cutting off the possibility, the choice for this fire to go any further. Bottom line, this is what I'm saying. Whatever it is that gives you entrance back into the lifestyle God delivered you from, remove the gates. Choose, I'm not going back. Everyone say, I'm not going back. Everyone say, remove the gates. I've decided I'm following Jesus. There's no going back. If one thing I do, I'm staying in Jesus. 31 times in the New Testament, you can find where it refers to us being in Jesus. And I want you to get this mental picture. When you hear in Jesus, it literally means that you were entirely covered by Jesus. Every part of your being, mind, body, spirit, you are covered in Jesus. God no longer sees you. God sees the righteousness of Jesus because you're saying, I'm removing the possibility of going back. I have decided I'm gonna follow Jesus. I want all of us to sing this together today. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning. Today, I want you to lift your hands in this place. And that's, I just want it to be that simple. God, I've decided no matter what life brings me, I'm choosing you. God, I've decided I'm not turning and running 
no matter what happens. God, there's no turning back. I've decided I'm staying in you. I'm removing the gates. Come on, let's sing. I have decided to follow.